To start the day, um, our first session today will consist of shining the light of even more of our brightest minds on the continent. So I will be calling on each NEF fellow to come and uh, exhibit their research and discovery one by one. To start, I would like to call upon Dr. Kevin Zobo to come forward for his presentation. Dr. Zobo, welcome. Good morning, uh, um, humans and animals lose tissues and organs due to several reasons, including congenital defects, diseases, and trauma. Unfortunately, the human body has a low regenerative capacity compared to other animals, such as the salamander. The salamander is considered a superpower when it comes to tissue or limb regeneration. This is because the salamander is able to regenerate its limbs within a short period of time once it is broken or injured, as shown in this small video. So the question that we ask in our laboratory is, if the salamander can do this, why can't human beings' uh, bodies do the same thing? Tissue and organ shortages have been identified as a major public health challenge with only a few deserving patients uh, getting the necessary transplantation. Many hospital waiting lists do not capture the magnitude of the crisis, partly because only sick people would go to the hospital seeking assistance. The rest would rather die at home. Globally, you see that uh, many people would benefit immensely if tissues and organs can be replaced on demand. Imagine going to the hospital and you need an organ and you can get it. Traditionally, uh, transplantation of int uh, intact tissues and organs has been the bedrock to replace diseased and damaged tissues and organs. The traditional reliance on these uh, donated tissues and organs, it faces the problem of donor shortages and the possible immunological rejection of the donated body parts. Therefore, the development of an endless supply of tissues and organs that can be used for transplantation, it represents one of the major challenges of our generation. And scientists and clinicians coming together have been developing strategies and protocols trying to come up or to, to create new tissues altogether or to regenerate damaged or diseased tissues. This is where regenerative medicine and tissue engineering comes in. The promise of regenerative medicine is founded on the potential and the ability to replace diseased or damaged tissues with laboratory-grown tissues, humanized animal tissues and organs, and bioartificial organs. As you can see in this uh, small graph over here, you can see that for kidney transplant, the number of people receiving kidney transplant and the number of people that require kidney transplant, there's a huge gap between the two. So generally, supply cannot meet demand. So there is need to come up with new ways to create or to regenerate diseased tissues. As you can see, whilst organ and tissue shortages are a worldwide crisis, Africa has been affected the most, with very few organ or tissue transplantation taking place on the African continent. And this is partly due to the cost that is involved in doing these operations, and also the lack of the technological advancement needed for, for such operations. I would like to tell you, uh, I would like to share with you one reason why Africa is about to take a giant leap in terms of regenerative medicine. This is because my colleagues and I in our laboratory, we have been able to come up with ways or strategies that can create tissues and hopefully in the future, organs that can be used for transplantation. So this is the, 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 the hope that regenerative medicine can create different tissues and organs that can be used for transplantation. So how do we make tissues and organs? One of the tissues that we are interested in making is cartilage. You find that many sportsmen, farm workers, mining workers, professionals like you and me, have had their careers either cut short or their lives dramatically changed due to cartilage problems. 
Uh, regenerative medicine, coupled together with 3D printing using stem cells, is an increasing viable option that can be used uh, to create new tissues or to regenerate diseased or damaged tissues. So how do we make a tissue such as cartilage? We start off with a scaffold. And the scaffold, we make it using cells that we get from the patient that requires the transplant. Onto the scaffold, we add stem cells. By now, I think most of you uh, know about stem cells. Stem cells are, are an amazing type of cells that are present in your bodies, and they can differentiate into different cells and tissues. Now, the hard part is that for you to induce stem cells into different tissues, you have to add a lot of uh, reagents, growth factors, cytokines, small molecules. This process will have to be done over and over again until you get the right tissue or material. This process is even expensive, even in developed countries. So, the exciting part is that my colleagues and I, we found a way to make um, tissues and possibly organs in the future in a cheap way. We have found a way to bypass the addition of growth factors, cytokines, small molecules, and so forth. So how do we do this? We have been able to use an experimental system that is composed of uh, different biomaterials that can induce differentiation of adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cells, for example, into cartilage using a process called controgenic differentiation. But most importantly, we were able to show the mechanism behind the process, which is very important because then, when you have made enough tissues, you can then stop the uh, process, or if the process is not going forward nicely, you can increase the speed of the process. We were able to use a different type of stem cells known as pluripotent stem cells, and we were able to induce endodermal differentiation using our experimental system, meaning that we are able to form lung tissue and uh, pancreatic tissue. And hopefully down the line, we'll be able to help people with lung cancer and also diabetic people. Okay. And then again, most importantly, we were able to show through the mechanism that you can in speed up the process and you can stop the process. So this means that then we can then take advantage of one of the most impressive technological advancements of the past two decades, which is 3D printing. So after doing a proteomic analysis of analyzing the scaffold that we were using to see the proteins and the factors present, we were then able to take individual proteins and factors, mix them with our stem cells, and then put them in a 3D printer. Now, we don't call it 3D printing anymore. We call it 3D bioprinting because we are using biological material. So what will happen then is that our 3D printer will print whatever tissue that you want, either a tissue or a patch that can then be used for transplantation as illustrated in this small video. Okay, so basically what will happen is that using 3D printing, you can look at the damage or the injury that the patient has suffered. You take a picture of that, you do your analysis, and you put the information into a 3D printer, into your computer, and then you tell the 3D printer to use your biological material that you have put inside to print exactly what needs to be used for transplantation. And so what will happen is that at the end, the surgeon or the doctor on the day of the operation will either have a page that they can use, especially for skin or for any other organ, or they will have a little piece of tissue that is custom, custom made and personalized because most of the cells that we use for our experiments or for our, uh, in, in future, will be, we will get those cells from the patient that requires the transplantation. So there is no possible immunological rejection of that piece of tissue. But most importantly, we should never forget why we are doing this kind of research. For us and my colleagues, we are doing this research because there are so many people in society that need our help. We are talking of accident victims, we are talking of burn victims, we are talking of trauma victims. Even soldiers who have gone to war and have come back with different types of injuries and broken limbs. These are, these are the people that we are trying to help. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zobo. Up next is Dr. Aku Kwami. Dr. Kwami. You're welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. 
It's a privilege to be here, and I thank God for the opportunity. So I'm a health systems researcher. I look at health systems, how they work, and how they're governed. And I use complexity science to make sense of what's going on. And there's one thing I'm certain of. For health systems to do what we expect them to, deliver quality care to all who need it, affordably, acceptably, and appropriately, the way we understand how they're governed has to change. And there's something that I've noticed in my research over and over again in Ghana. There's a common complaint. Management is weak. Leadership is lacking. And this particular criticism is often reserved for the local level where policy implementation unfolds. The solution has often been to train. So through the Ministry of Health, we ran management and leadership trainings for district health managers. This is a picture from one of our workshops. And we found that after learning these new practices, managers were able to get their clinic teams to increase the numbers of mothers giving birth in clinic and reduce the numbers of stillbirths. So this was incredibly impressive. But within months, managers had reverted back to their old practices and health outcomes began to fall again. So what accounts for this systemic inertia? Now, most of our governance frameworks are focused on regulating the system. That's to say they're about the rules. But what if we began thinking of governing from within the system itself? That's to say from the relationships. So instead of starting from prescriptions of idealized good governance versus bad governance, what if we took the time to understand the existing relationships in a system and use that as the basis for our interventions? Now, I know that may sound basic, but let me share some examples from my work to explain what I mean. Now, often there's a mismatch between the rules and the relationships. So let's take the example of poor staff attitude, a common problem which affects quality of care. Now, when we worked with staff to diagnose the issue, they reasoned as follows. Staff attitude is poor because staff lack good customer care. This is because they have inadequate knowledge of customer care, because they've not been trained in customer care. Therefore, the solution is to provide customer care training. So in this case, the rules state that regulating the system through trainings can increase levels of staff knowledge, which can then be applied to improving the system. Yet, when we looked at the same issue from the managerial perspective, the response was more like this. Any time your leader tells you something, she has a plan. Only one person can lead. Others follow faithfully. Yours is to do as you are told. The rest, she will manage. So this tells us that in this case, the relationships are based on hierarchy and authority. So the problem here is not one of needing more skills or more knowledge, but rather of nurturing better quality relationships at the front line. So it means that trainings in this case become ineffective because managers are trained at the personal level, but then they're sent back into the same old bureaucratic structures. New ways of learning and practice eventually get squeezed out. Inertia. So co complexity science tells us that a complex system is made up of many interacting components. And it's what happens within these interactions, so within the relationships, which gives rise to the overall character of the system. Complexity science helps us to link the macro structures, so the rules, which are visible and can be measured, link these to the micro incentives, so things like understandings, motivations, values, and experiences, which are often hiding within relationships. It exposes the ongoing tensions that exist between the formal and the informal, and between people and procedures. Now, rules are simple. We know them when we see them, but rules alone don't govern people. Relationships are dynamic and complex, and they take time to understand. And by focusing on health system relationships rather than health system rules, my research is opening up a new window on alternative remedies to governance. It helps us to see governance as a practice rather than governance as an instrument. These relationships filter whether policies at the front line work or don't work. These relationships are what keep the health system moving. 
And in fact, when we fed back these findings to government, the comment that we got from one senior official was, if we keep running these trainings with their limited impact, then in fact we're causing financial loss to the state. It means that we can count the cost of how we govern and make the economic argument for why our traditional approaches to governance no longer make sense. In the context of resource constraints, that's pretty compelling. And so, in a future of increasing uncertainties, African health systems face a huge crunch, like this overcrowded antenatal clinic. Health systems will have to deliver more and better quality services to increasing populations with changing demographics, and will have to staff and finance it all. Now, just listen to all that we've heard in the past two days. No African government is banking its future development on 19th century technologies or 19th century infrastructures. So why should we continue using 19th century governance models? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kwame. Up next is Dr. Tolulope Olugboji. Dr. Olugboji, welcome. Good morning. So, Africa was once at the center of the world. That is before Africa and the tectonic plates broke up into smaller plates. Today, Africa sits on the second largest continental plate. And as a computational seismologist, I unlock the information digitized on ever-increasing, globe-encircling seismic sensors that have been listening to our Earth shaking. Those sensors are triangles in red on the video that you're seeing. So while these sensors are definitely useful for revealing and forecasting when the fault in Botswana may shake the Earth again, like it did in an earthquake in 2017, or when the volcanoes of Odonyo Lengai in Tanzania may soon erupt. You might be wondering, why does an African study earthquakes on a continent that is least likely to have one? Well, I do not just listen to earthquakes. Part of my job description involves listening to any and every source of ground vibration. That happens when ocean waves crash on the seashore, or hurricanes shake the earth, or slow-moving gravity waves trapped in the fluid envelopes of earth, or, or when sometimes North Korea sets off worrying nuclear explosion. I listen to all these sources of ground vibration. I then use these sources of ground vibration using advances in wave theory, statistics, and high-performance computing to build images of Earth's interior. So this might be a little involving, so I'll take it slow, and I want you to just look at the images. So here in the center of the map of this um, picture is over 2,000 sensors deployed across the U.S. over the past decade that have been listening to the Earth shaking. I'll then use computational algorithms to build the image of the shallowest continental rocks of the U.S. We're using high-performance computing infrastructure, massive computational um, resources to build images of the shallowest rocks using uh, this sophisticated computational algorithm. The computer begins to guess the image. It learns what part of the image are well-resolved and what part of the image are less resolved. By the time the algorithm is complete, you realize that the computer has already solved the solution. It is almost like Darwin's theory of evolution, survival of the fittest model, in this case, the best image. On the bottom, you see snapshots of the algorithm as you go from the beginning to the end. 
and by the end, you have a complete detail of the image. So um, this algorithm has built the final solution of the shallowest continental rocks by learning the complete solution. It is auto-adaptive. So who am I? I'm not just an academic doctor. I am an earth doctor. I place a stethoscope on the surface of the earth and build the computational brains that help reveal the anatomy of the entire planet. From the continents, from the high standing peaks of the continents like Mount Kilimanjaro to the red hot interior depths of Earth's inner core, I use seismology to make the invisible visible. So, although we might not be able to break up the Earth and reveal all that's inside of it, we can use this remote sensing technology to reveal Africa's resources. But not just that. Seismology and all the Earth sciences is not just useful for mapping resources. They can tell us and explain to us why some parts of the African continent hold spectacular mountains, like the mountains Ras Dashen in Ethiopia, or the beautiful bodies of water, like the lakes Tanganyika, Inyasa, Victoria, that are formed by the breakup of uh, uh, Africa as Tanzania, Uganda, and Rwanda prepare to break off from the rest of Africa. That's spectacular. And that might be the actual only case where a breakup leads to something that is beautiful. <laughs> so, you've heard about tectonic plates. You've heard about the research I do using uh, seismology to help reveal tectonic plates. But much of Africa's tectonic plates is still yet not well understood and not studied. And much of Africa's natural history and physical geology is studied in most, most part by non-Africans. Uh, but because our land is not just the key to the past and the future, but holds uh, an, uh, the foundation of our identity and our culture, it is important that African scientists lead the study of African land and African geology. Because the maps because the maps we create will form part of our heritage. It is only when we create our maps that we'll be masters of our identity. And it is in this way that the sciences help us not just understand the earth around us, but to master ourselves. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Maracuze. Thank you, Dr. Olukboji. Up next is Professor Hamidou Tembine. Professor Tembine, you're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, bonjour. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Hello, everyone. Two years ago, many of you were in Dakar, in Senegal. And many of you wanted to collaborate, at least to initiate collaboration. Two years later, we are here in Kigali. How many of you are still interested in collaborating? So game theory addresses these challenges, tells you how we can make the collaboration happen. How can we collaborate? That is the question, and that's the challenge. The Pan-African Competitive Game Theory is one of the approaches we are developing to address those challenges. 
because there are challenges. We have, for example, multiple objectives. Objective about education, about water, about energy, about environment, about transportation. Those objectives are not necessarily aligned. And that's why we have challenges to address them. That is the question, and the, we want strategies that can make this collaboration possible. If you look at Africa, the continent, we are not alone, we are interconnected. A few years ago, if you were in some villages in Africa, if you had a chance to stop by, there were no cell phone at all. Nowadays, they are having smarter phones, those that are able to connect to the internet. They can recognize your picture and so on. So we are getting more and more interconnected. This can be viewed as a network of decision-making players. The decision made by one person in this audience will propagate and affect at least a subset of other people in the audience in the city here, within the country, within the continent, and all across the world. The information flow that we are generating in this audience, you could see on the social networks. We affect others. What can we expect from this? Can we expect a collaborative effort toward picking the best decision? Our joint effort to pick the best decision. Is that possible? Game theory has several branches, and one of them is non-cooperative game theory. If you look at the dots, these countries, inside you have institutions, and then you have companies, and you have people. If they act selfishly, or they are optimizing for their own interest, we call it competitive game theory. The outcome could be dramatic if you don't design very well these objectives. It could be a situation where the more competitive ones grow faster and the less competitive ones are trained down. Some of them are going to disappear. This is the wrong model. We don't want that. What we want could be for example, a full cooperation among the countries. Then you see all the interconnections between those nations. This is too ideal, because it has to be perfect knowledge, perfect information across all the countries and the interconnections between them. The third approach, what we are proposing here, is about competition. What does it mean? It's not about non-cooperation. It is not about pure cooperation. It is about working together. It is about co-learning. It is about competitive cooperation. It is about cooperative competition. So I draw a baobab tree here so that you see that there are more interconnections, and the baobab tree is across all Africa. We want to be in the middle. We don't want full cooperation, although we, it's an ideal solution. We don't want pure competition. We want to learn together, to evolve together, and 
Game theory is developing such approaches to reach the solution concept. Control, regulation, voluntary contributions, learning, incentives, and so on, so that the countries can work together, co-learn for the co-development, and they reach the final outcome, and they co-evolve with other countries and with the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Tembine. Our last NEF fellow for this session is Dr. Yvonne Mbouru. Dr. Mbouru, you are welcome. Good morning. It's my eighth week at the Marie Curie Institute, and I love my job. I love Paris, actually. But today, I'm thinking about my family back home in Nairobi, because there's been bad news. It turns out it's not tuberculosis. It's lung cancer, and it's stage four, and it's my favorite aunt. Heading home to my apartment, I'm feeling sad and confused because I know enough to know. I've spent eight years of my career working on this topic, so I know. I know how serious this is. I also know that her best shot is to leave Kenya. In my mind, we've got to get her to the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York and possibly on an immunotherapy clinical trial. But there would be heavy costs associated with this, and precious time away from family. So after realizing with my family that it's not practical to send her to New York or London or Mumbai, where some of these treatments are most likely to be available, we, like many Kenyan families, decide to look for options in Kenya but there's only 14 oncologists in Kenya. There's 48 million people in Kenya determined to find her the best treatment. So my family trusts me to lead the charge because, you know, I am an immuno-oncologist, a field of research that aims to reprogram the immune system so that it can directly fight cancer. These days, all the newspapers and journals are touting this new field of research as the next best hope for cancer treatment. It's called immunotherapy. In fact, the field is so new and revolutionary that the very first immunotherapy drugs were only approved by the FDA in 2011. My research is on bladder cancer. You see, today, bladder cancer is treated using the tuberculosis vaccine, and it works in 70% of people. But we still don't fully understand why. So my job is to explore whether there are certain kinds of cell, called mate cells, are responsible for the successful treatment of this cancer. Today, I'm thinking about immunotherapy, but for lung cancer. And how can my aunt get access to this treatment? Does it even matter to my aunt, to a Kenyan, to any African, really, that I'm working on immunotherapy, that I'm among a group of researchers that are advancing the field of cancer research, that are finding the latest treatments in immunotherapy. Does it matter to the Africans on the continent that some of their people are working abroad on these very questions? And I'm deeply dissatisfied with the order of things, because it seems to me unbelievably unfair that no matter what I do, my work, my discoveries, my contributions to the field will help my country and my continent last. So over time, it was driving me crazy that I didn't know how many of us are actually out there. How many immunologists? How many cardiologists? How many surgeons? 
How would I even go about finding that out? That was in 2012. I would spend years brainstorming this problem of not knowing. I wasn't going to quit my job, I just started. But yet I was still incredibly moved and driven to map this seemingly invisible network of African expertise that's all over the world. I was already in my job collaborating with Australian scientists who lived in Australia and whom I'd never met. And so I kept wondering, why can't I do the same research, collaborative research, with Kenyan researchers, or Zimbabwean researchers, or Nigerian ones? And how could we find each other and collaborate on shared interests? And so in 2016, I took a giant leap away from the Curie Institute and launched a platform called Made in Africa. Our very first mission is to map every African scientist and health professional on the planet. Because I want to know who is doing what and who is doing it where. It turns out, we later found, that there are more Kenyan oncologists in the UK and in the US than there are in Kenya. And that there are more Beninois doctors in France than there are in Benin. And that there are more Nigerian doctors in, well, you get where I'm going with this. Made in Africa is also a digital meeting place where researchers and health professionals in Africa can connect to African researchers all over the world. With 192 countries and 7.5 billion people on the planet, you can imagine that collecting and processing this data into usable insights is an all-consuming process. But I wake up every day excited and hopeful because this is one of the most human problems that big data and artificial intelligence can solve. And that gets to the heart of my mission. We are creating comprehensive profiles, detailed identities of African researchers in every field of expertise and clinical practice. And we're building the artificial intelligence that will help us quickly identify and mobilize African voices to address any health issue on the continent. Collaborations, we spoke about that. Hematologists and cardiologists that work on sickle cell anemia, for example. Immunologists working on malaria, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, sleeping sickness, getting more scientists and funding into tropical diseases that are often relegated as African problems and often ignored by the rest of the world. But then I wonder, can I do this? And why me? And I realize I don't have to be alone. I cannot do it alone, but we can do it together. We can do everything with the data and the cyber networks and the artificial intelligence and the analysis of all these. But in the end, it is you, the humans, that must power the platform. How many of you know someone who works in science or health. Stand up. You're a scientist, you know a scientist, you know a doctor, you know a, a nurse. You, my friends, must mobilize the community around you. You must get them, the policy makers, the scientists, the doctors, the nurses, those that are here and those that are abroad. And you must get them moving to join me so that we can transform Africa together. The countdown begins. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mburu. We have seen them. We have heard them. We do have them. It's happening now. In Africa, we have the brightest of the minds in terms of science and technology. So as we go from one peak to another, we will be reaching the next session, which is the peak session that will also shed more light to breakthroughs from across the world. Before we do that, uh, we will need five minutes. We'll give you just five minutes for you to stay in the room, just to stretch a little bit, and it will also give us time to proceed with the next session. So we will restart in five minutes. Please do stay in the room. Thank you.